Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Betting Pros podcast brought to you by BetMGM. I'm your host, Dan Harris. Find me on Twitter at DanHarris80. It is time to talk about our best bets for week 10 of the NFL season. Here with me to do that is Ben Stevens, host of The Morning After over on SportsGrid. Find him on Twitter at Ben Scott Stevens. Ben, thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to pop on today. How you doing? I'm doing well, Dan. Thank you for having me. When Joe Pisapia comes calling, who is the one that introduced us from Fantasy Pros, I often listen. And when Joe yeah. P asks for something, I like to oblige as best I can. So I'm very glad to be here, and I'm excited to talk some NFL football with you. Well, your opinion already means less uh, to me than uh, <laughs> what it did before if you were valuing sure. Joey P. But uh, I do appreciate Joe's uh, help here in getting us together. All right, let's get into it. Uh, you guys know what the show is. We are going to give our three favorite bets for this weekend, it can be anything, can be spread, can be total, can be money line, can be player props, whatever we want. And then we will quickly just run through the remaining spreads just to get our very, very brief thoughts on it. Before we get into it, let me remind you about our latest offer from BetMGM, our sponsor. New customers bet $10 and win $200 if the team you bet on scores a touchdown. That is all. You got to use the code JUICE100 which is based on our other podcast, The Daily Juice, hosted by Matt Peralt. This is available in New Jersey, Colorado, Indiana, West Virginia, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Virginia, Iowa, Washington, D.C., Arizona, and Wyoming. Again, Juice 100 over at BetMGM for new customers. Bet $10. Win $200 if the team you bet on scores a touchdown. Quick recap of last week. Our guest, Andrew Cayley, went 2-1. and one. He hit on the Chargers laying two to the Eagles. The Bears getting 6.5 from the Steelers. He missed on the Chiefs team total. Over 27 and a half. I also went two and one. I hit on the Browns getting two and a half from the Bengals, the Vikings and the Ravens going over 50, but I missed on the 49ers laying one to the Cardinals. That puts me at 16 and 11 through nine weeks with our best bets. All right, we're going to bettingpros.com for the aggregate lines. You guys know all about that uh, there. Let's start with you, Ben. What's your top pick of the weekend? Dan, I didn't know there was going to be a recap portion for next week's podcast, oh, yeah. looking back oh, yeah. at these picks. So now I'm a little bit scared to my future yep. self and to the future audience out there. Hopefully, I did not lead you astray. So one of my favorite bets this weekend is the New Orleans Saints getting points on the road against the Tennessee Titans. Yes, I know that sounds like a scary proposition. The Saints lost last week in an absolute dud to the Atlanta Falcons. The Tennessee Titans might be the hottest team in all of football. They have won five straight. They have covered in five straight, the last four even as an underdog. But there is an interesting trend going on in the NFL right now that I have liked to capitalize on this year. And that's when a team puts out a dud they generally bounce back pretty well the following week, and that is the case for the New Orleans Saints right now. Following a loss this year, New Orleans is 2-0 and against the number, and they are covering by that number of 13.5 points per game in the two times they have responded after a loss. So I like where New Orleans is, where it currently stands, and New Orleans even being on the road getting points has been pretty good as an underdog so far this year. 3-0 and against the spread as an underdog, and I mentioned Tennessee has been so great lately Four straight covers as a dog themselves, as a favorite this year, just two and two against the spread. So I think that the good times have been rolling for the Tennessee Titans. They head back to the Music City. Hard to pick against them. I think just at this point, maybe things slow down. A response last week after losing Derrick Henry, not saying this is going to be the trend for Tennessee moving forward, just in this one spot this week, that the winning streak has to come to an end sometime. Why not against the New Orleans Saints getting two and a half points this upcoming Sunday? At some point, the magic has to end here, right? right. For the Titans, like I, if for no other reason than just mentally and emotionally getting up for these giant games and somehow pulling out these these incredible victories. At some point, there's going to be a letdown. This would have been my pick. I, I told you, I, I like to ask the guests generally to send me uh, his picks. This would have been <laughs> one of mine as well, which is good that we're on the same side. And again, there are some threes out there. I'm looking over. It's two and a half or threes yeah. for me at DraftKings. It's two and a half. And at FanDuel, at, uh, you know, at BetMGM, it's three. At PointsBet, it's three. So you can get some threes out there. Yeah, Sean Payton, just generally, man, uh, you know, against the spread as an underdog. Uh, generally pretty good. And again, you're right. The trends this year, teams especially coming off a uh, loss against the spread versus teams coming off a win against the spread, it very much favors the underdog. So I do like this one as well. It would have been uh, on mine, but uh, I cannot take it. Obviously, you take it, but I'm backing you. And hopefully next week, people look back fondly uh, on that one. I'm going to go here. I, you know, I, I argued with this one um, with Joe when we did the look ahead uh, lines on podcast on Tuesday about what we thought he was on the other side. I said I'd revisit. I did revisit. I held my stance. I'm still sticking with the Browns uh, getting two and a half against the Patriots in New England. So 
Uh, this is really same as last week where I took the Browns getting the points against the Bengals. I still think the Browns are a little bit undervalued here in the market. And I think the Patriots might be a little overvalued. We start with the Patriots. I mean, they're five and four, but four of their wins, two of them have come against the Jets, uh, one of them against the Texans, and then one of them against the Panthers with a pretty injured Sam Darnold. They've got injuries at running back right now. Neither Damian Harris nor Ramondre Stevenson has practiced yet this week, including today as they recover from head injury, potential concussions. Mac Jones, really just a game manager, like most rookie quarterbacks, not great under pressure. That is what Cleveland does. They get a ton of pressure. Second highest clip in the league at a 28.4% pressure rate. And the Browns, I'm just buying the Browns. I, I think they are coming together here after Odell Beckham Jr. is out. I think Baker Mayfield plays better without Odell Beckham Jr. They used to be a joke. Now it's for real. Um, Nick Chubb is probably going to be out for this game. That, of course, is worth mentioning. Not definitely yet. I haven't seen anything that says that he he officially, you know, it's very difficult to, to get the two, uh, you know, negative COVID tests in 24 hours when you test positive on a Tuesday. But it is possible. But either way, we saw Dearness Johnson perform well against uh, the Browns. And, the, against the uh, Broncos, pardon me. And the Pats have a great defense, but they're much better against the pass. Six in defensive DVOA against the pass. 17th against the run. They don't get a ton of pressure, just 18th in the pressure rate. So the bottom line is, I just, I think the Browns are a better team. They're sixth yeah. overall in DVOA. The Patriots are 13th. Uh, home field, they're one and four at home. So it's not like home field advantage is what it used to be with Brady. So I don't know, man. I think the Browns find a way to win this game. So I will certainly take them getting two and a half here. Yeah, Dan, I love that spot, honestly, for the Cleveland Browns. It's something we were monitoring all week on the show. I looked at this line on Tuesday. It was at two and a half for an opener in favor of the Patriots. I saw it come down all the way to one. So I thought there was some early sharp movement yep. early in the week on the Cleveland Browns thinking, hey, we're getting them as a dog even in this situation. And it's not like Gillette has been a great home field advantage for Mac Jones in his rookie season. One and four straight up, two and three against the spread. I kind of like Cleveland in what might be a close game. And I think Cleveland getting the points in this situation is a really good spot to have the Browns this Sunday. Yeah, and there is a one and a half. You're right. It had moved a little bit. FanDuel, by the way, is still at one and a half. I'm just looking mm -hmm. at the consensus lines at Betting Pros. There's a two out there over at BetMGM, but the vast majority of books still at two and a half, including my book, again, DraftKings here from New Hampshire. So the consensus line stays at two and a half. I will take it. But yeah, it's not getting a three. Like, that's where I thought it was. If anything, it's sort of bouncing back down there. So yeah, I do think the Browns win this game. I'll back them again as the uh, you know short underdog here, as I did last week. Number two pick, Ben, go for it. I am going to a total. That features a team called the New York Jets. And I know that might sound like a crazy proposition, and I understand, but follow me here. The New York Jets have played five straight games to an over. Let us not forget last Thursday night against the Indianapolis Colts when we had seen six straight unders hit on Thursday night football. The Jets said enough of that, and it was a game where they allowed 45 points a week following or two weeks following, allowing 54 to the New England Patriots, and the Colts and the Jets combined for 75 points on Thursday night football. So the Jets have played in five straight overs in the over under total that I see now for the Buffalo Bills and the New York Jets at MetLife on Sunday is 48. It opened at 48, came down by a hook to 47 and a half as I saw it, now back to 48. I like it there. Although Buffalo has not been quite as good offensively the last couple of weeks, AKA the six, they scored against the Jacksonville Jaguars, still the fourth best scoring offense in the NFL, averaging just below 30 points. I think they want to reinstate the fact they're one of the best offensive teams and can be that explosive. And it's a good opportunity against the New York Jets. Because again, although the Jets have played five straight overs, a lot of that has come from New York, allowing their opponent to rack up the points. 54 to the Pats three weeks ago. Last week on Thursday night, they gave up 45 to the Indianapolis Colts on a short week. Even that overtime thrilling win or the upset win rather against the Cincinnati Bengals that didn't quite reach overtime. They allowed Cincy to score 31 points. I think the Bills can get over 30 pretty easily. And I actually think the Jets are going to add a little bit to the equation as well. So I was thinking about a Buffalo team total, but that spurned me in the past a couple of weeks ago against the Miami Dolphins. So I decided just game total overall, knowing the trends for the Jets. And although Buffalo has played five of the last eight games to the under, including two straight unders, I still think that Buffalo and New York can combine to score more than 48 points on Sunday. Yeah, I like it. Uh, there are 47 and a halves out there still, as you mentioned, it's back and forth. A lot of books, most books at 48, some at 47 and a half, again, including DraftKings, where I bet. But uh, yeah, I like it. Uh, I do think this is, it has to be a get right spot here for the Bills offense. Has it sputtered a little bit, as you know, sure. we were talking about over the last couple of weeks, but this is a great spot for them. Um, the Jets secondary, which had admirably played pretty decently 
in the first few weeks has now basically shown what it is, which is a bunch of no names and can be easily exploited uh, by really any of the Bills wide receivers. And I do think that the league sort of hasn't yet figured out Mike White, who is going to start in this game. And yeah. he has played better than expected. So I do still think we've got another week or two where he's going to be. I mean, they might have won that game frankly, had White not gotten injured. I mean, they were giving up a ton of points, but he drove them down pretty well in, in that drive there before he got injured. So I do think he's going to be able to put up points even against this very, very good defense. So I agree with you that the the total, you know, overall total better than even the Buffalo team total. So I'm with you on this one as well. Uh, I'm going to stick in my same game and be kind of boring here and just very quickly because it says, look, I, it's not that exciting. Sorry, but if I'm talking about the bets that I like the most, this is one, and that is the Browns and the Pats under 45 points here. Uh, right. It kind of goes with just what I was saying before. You've got two above average defenses, generally speaking. Both teams run the ball. The Browns run it 49% of the time. That's third most in the NFL. The Pats run it 43% of the time. That's ninth most in the NFL. Obviously, when you run the ball, the clock runs with it. That lends itself just generally towards an under. Both teams also can stop the run. So, you know, I don't expect these touchdown drives. I expect, you know, a couple plays, blah, 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 going a little bit running the clock before some punts go. Again, you've got injuries to running backs on both sides. It's going to make it even less effective. This just strikes me to me, again, as a game that's going to be close, that both teams are going to just sort of look to grind it out defensively, you know, a little bit like the Pats and the Panthers last week. And it's just a game that, look, betting unders in the NFL, Ben, you know, like it, it's just a terrifying proposition, just generally yeah. speaking, except last week. Um, but uh, <laughs> for me, I, I do think that this is just going to be a game that's going to be kind of a defensive battle that eventually the Browns are going to be able to sneak out here with, with a win. That's where I'm going. But uh, I do think that this strikes me just as a game that's going to be like 21-17, somewhere around there and coming at the under. What do you think? Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. The Pats have been a very, very streaky team as it pertains to totals this year. The first four games, solidly under. And then I think the market readjusted. And then the next four, the Patriots played all to the over. And then last week, where I thought we were getting a very dismal total against the Carolina Panthers, I wanted to work in market contradiction of having seen that total drop to as low as 40 and a half or 41 and maybe taken over in that spot. The Pats scored 24, but then Sam Darnold, and the Carolina Panthers offense didn't really hold up their end of the bargain, only scoring six. So another under for the New England Patriots. And Dan, I think you bring up a great point. If the Cleveland Browns don't have Nick Chubb and they don't have the reliability in that ground game, that is what they want to do. They run the ball at one of the highest clips in all of the NFL. And if you force it into Baker Mayfield's hands, although he might be happy without Odell Beckham Jr. right now, I think that is the advantage to Bill Belichick being able to scheme against what might have to be a heavy passing attack from the Cleveland Browns. So I don't think having the running backs on either side, because like you mentioned earlier, both Damian Harris and Ramon J. Stevenson currently in concussion protocol and neither practice on Wednesday during that midweek portion. I think that kind of takes away what both offenses do best. And it makes their quarterbacks play out on an Island more, which is a more dangerous proposition for scoring points in this game. I think if, even if it does go to Cleveland's way that they are able to win that football game, they are able to grind it out just a little bit more than new England. So I think the under is a pretty correlated market right there for sure. And by the way, Harris and Stevenson also didn't practice already today. Like I just saw a report that came out. So there's a realistic chance that both are going to be gone. And I love Brandon Bolden, but I, I don't think you really want to rely on him generally as your every down back. All right. Your third pick here, sir. What do you have? I am going with a prop, and it is not out yet a lot of places because we are recording this on a Thursday afternoon, and it is for the Sunday night football game. I was hoping prime time, the Chiefs and the Raiders out in the desert, maybe we'd get this early. But I want Derek Carr's passing attempts prop. Dan, the reason I like passing attempts at times more than passing yards is because all you need for them is to throw the football. It can airmail their receiver by 15 yards down the field. Still counts in our way of getting to an over, and Derek Carr and the Las Vegas Raiders have been throwing the football a ton this year. Derek Carr in seven of the eight games Vegas has played so far has had at least 34 passing attempts. Last week against the Giants, even in a loss, he had 46 passing attempts. He is averaging 39 passing attempts per game. So generally in what I have seen throughout the marketplace, even on the top end of quarterbacks who throw it a ton, the highest passing attempts prop you'll get, 33 and a half, 34 and a half, maybe even a 35 and a hook, as long as it doesn't eclipse that number. And I think it will probably be somewhere around a 33 and a half, 34 and a half for the primetime affair against Kansas City. I would still 
take an over. As we know, Kansas City's defense has a multitude of issues. So you could attack them on the ground or through the air. But I think the Raiders are going to look to throw the football with Derek Carr. 46 again last week against the New York Giants. At least 34 in seven of the eight games the Raiders have played this year. If it's around that ballpark of 34, 34 and a hook, I would take the over for Derek Carr in primetime on Sunday night. What do you think that your line is where you would say, okay, this is at a spot where it's too much. This scares me a little bit. I'm going to avoid it entirely. 35 and a half, I'd get a little bit shaky, but then I'd look at the line and I'd say, do I want to do it? Yeah, okay, yeah, no, I'm going to go with it. I'll go 35 and a half because, Dan, I'm not sure if you can see. That's how we do this here. That is a retro photo of 1980s Arrowhead Stadium. Although I grew up in Los Angeles, I did not grow up with a football team in Los Angeles. So at the tender age of six years young, I fell in love with a man by the name of Priest Holmes who taught me all I needed to know about running the football in the NFL. So I've been a Chiefs fan for a very long time. My confidence in the Chiefs and back them as a road favorite in prime time against the Raiders minus two and a half when they have a two and seven record against the spread the second worst mark in the NFL I'm not going to do that and although Derek Carr and looking at him to find some profitability in the prop market if he goes over his passing attempts prop it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm hoping the Chiefs lose the football game sure. so that's how I'll have some skin in the game for Sunday night I'm still uh, reeling from the fact that I think you said you were six and Priest Mahomes. Yeah. Is, is that Priest uh, Holmes? Sorry, not Mahomes. Yes. Yeah, there I am. <laughs> six years old and Priest Holmes. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I'm not an old man whatsoever. It's totally fine. Okay, <laughs> uh, let's go to my final pick. I'm, I'm actually really interested to hear what you think about this one, Ben, because I, I looked at this one closely. I was kind of on both sides. And then it came down to a very simple, like there's no trends or anything like that. It came back to a very simple sort of way I'm thinking about it. It's the Seahawks getting three and a half uh, from mm. the Packers and Lambeau. So I, I think this game is going to be close. That's personally how I see it. I wouldn't be surprised again if the Seahawks won. Two big things here. Uh, the first is I don't want to, I, I don't think we should underestimate. And I think people are going to underestimate how big a deal it is that Rodgers can't even get back into the facility until Saturday. Now there's again, the small chance that he's not going to play in this game. So you can factor that in if you want. I'm assuming he's going to play, but he can't get back till Saturday because that's the first day he can be cleared. Uh, and I know Russell Wilson has been out. Of course, Russell Wilson's going to come back for this. But again, he's been able to be there. He's been able to practice. He's been able to work with the team, getting ready for this game in particular. This is 10 straight days right now where the Packers offense has had to practice with Jordan Love. That is a big deal to me. And we've also seen quarterbacks, by the way, struggle a little bit when they come back after testing positive from COVID. We saw it last year. It's possible that, you know, Rodgers isn't at 100% physically just after testing positive. So there's that. The second is that these teams are actually more evenly matched than I think the public is going to give them credit for. Seattle is actually rated better uh, overall in DVOA, 12th in uh, DVOA. The Packers are 15th. This is a monstrous game for the Seahawks. They're on the outskirts of the playoff race. They obviously fell down a little bit with Geno Smith. They basically have to win. The Packers obviously want the number one seed, but the division is basically locked up. They're three and a half games ahead. This strikes me as a very, very close game. I would be shocked if the Packers just run with it. I'd be shocked if the Packers win this by a touchdown or 10 points or anything like that. I think it's a close game. Strikes me as a field goal game. So I'm going to take the hook here with the Seahawks, but I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about this. Well, Dan, I think it's going to be very interesting to monitor this line movement by about Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, when we get some kind of final confirmation on Aaron Rodgers, if he's even able to get out of the COVID-19 protocol in time to play this football game, because if he is not, this is going to close closer to a pick -up, maybe one and a half still sure. in Green Bay's favor. So we could be getting the best of the number. If Aaron Rodgers is back, I think it could work more in Green Bay's favor. And still, I would probably lean with Seattle maybe getting four and a half or five points. So I don't mind where it is right now. And again, I think you have the hook in your advantage here past that field goal. Because like you, this is not going to be a blowout on either side. Even if Aaron Rodgers is back. Green Bay could find a way to win, but if it's 24-21, I would not be shocked by any means. And I think adding Russell Wilson back, we know what Russ can do. We know what he was doing early on this year off to a great start for the Seahawks. A 72% completion percentage obviously makes that offense go in a way that even Geno Smith cannot. But credit to Geno Smith yes. because in the three games that he started, 3-0 and against the spread for the Seattle Seahawks. So they are 3-5 and five straight up. But they are a very interesting team to me, Dan, for how they look moving forward in the NFC postseason picture. Because if you look at any make playoff odds right now, the NFC, six of the seven spots that we will have for this postseason, virtually wrapped up based on yep. the odds. You have the Rams who are trailing in the NFC West. You have the New Orleans Saints who are trailing in the NFC South, but both heavily favored to earn a postseason berth. 
That seventh spot, though, is wide open right now in the NFC wildcard race. You could look at the Vikings. I have no confidence in Minnesota. I think although Seattle is coming from behind, having Russell Wilson back, I think the Seahawks become a very, very interesting team, and the Niners have left everything open in the NFC West where I would look at the Seahawks just a peg behind the Rams and the Cardinals. So I think this is a great spot for Seattle to get this momentum building toward the postseason. I think the Seattle Seahawks are going to be fascinating here in the second half of the year. Yeah, I think the Falcons may have the seventh spot right now in the NFC, and that's just not a team, right? (laughs) I know, it's nuts. That's not a team that you look at is going to run with that spot. Yeah, that's open. They need this right now. And there is the possibility, of course, that Wilson, because he's been out for several weeks, he's going to be rusty himself as well. But at least he has Mm -hmm. been back, and he's been able to practice and game plan for this. And you make the right point, which is correct, which is if you like the Seahawks, like you do, uh, you might as well bet it now, because if Rodgers obviously is not cleared, five points the other way maybe like yeah. i mean that right something you know we saw with jordan love so obviously you'll get the best number but if rogers is cleared and he is going to play maybe it moves maybe a point or something in the Packers. Right. so as long as you're over three but it's not like you're getting a seven or anything like that you might as well bet it now all right very very good okay so that is going to be our six uh picks for this weekend let me very quickly recap it you are taking the saints getting two and a half from it's getting two and a half from the titans which i also like the uh, Bills and the Jets over 48 points and Derek Carr over pass attempts. And what did we say the top number is? Anything above as long as it doesn't get to what, 35 and a half? As long as it's not it. over 35 and a half. 35 Correct. and a half would be the absolute ceiling. And I'd still probably be like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> Basically, whatever it is, you could take it. But certainly, <laughs> if it's as long as it's under 35 and a half, you want the over there. For me, I'm taking the Browns getting two and a half from the Patriots and the total in that game under 45. And I'm also taking the Seahawks getting three and a half from the Packers. All right, let's go lightning speed here very quickly. Your 10 cent thoughts on the remaining spreads. The Lions are visiting the Steelers. The Steelers are laying eight and a half. No, pass. <laughs> Just a total pass. Just a uh, pass. If I had to, if I had to, I probably would have to take the Lions. I'm not backing uh, Mike yep. Tomlin at home as a big favorite in a game that they should destroy because they'll probably <laughs> lose outright. Uh, how about the spread in the Bills and the Jets? Actually, this has come down here. It started early in the week at I think it might have been 14 and a half, perhaps. Yeah. When I first looked at it, it's 12 right now with the consensus line. There are some 13s out there. What do you think about it at 12? Are we about to get our second Mike White game in three weeks? Maybe so, but I think the market makes sense, and the Bills haven't covered in three straight the last two by nearly a two-touchdown favorite. I think I'm going to lean with the Jets. I mean, the Bills could still win by double digits, but that's how I would lean in this game. Yeah, I mean, you saw just how close the Jets were with Johnson, at quarterback, to backdoor covering that game yeah. last week with 12 points. I agree. I'd probably lean that way with Mike White. The Cowboys are home uh, against the Falcons, laying nine at the consensus here. I would like the under of this game. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's at 55. It's the highest total of the weekend. I know Dallas has a propensity to play over. Atlanta's defense has been a little bit better this year, and I think you're getting an inflated number on a Dallas team that still needs to figure some things out. I would go total first. If I'm looking at the spread, I actually think Dallas has an opportunity to get right here, and I think they hammer the Falcons. I do too. It was a game actually I considered whether or not I wanted to take because I do think that this is the bounce back spot right here for the Cowboys. Classic buy low, sell high with the Falcons beating the Saints last week. I think the yep. Cowboys might absolutely run with this game. But again, not an official pick. Colts get laying 10 and a half at home against the Jaguars. Dan, I don't know if you know this about me. I'm a fade Urban Meyer guy at all costs, so I will never pick the Jacksonville Jaguars even against the spread. We are going to take the Indianapolis Colts, who as a 10 and a half point favorite twice already this year, have covered both of those numbers. I'm in agreement with you, and I think you joined the 99% of the population in fading Urban Meyer. The Washington football team at home with the Bucks. Washington's getting nine and a half points. What do you think? A very interesting opposing trends here. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers have yet to win against the spread as a road team this year. 0-4 against the number. Washington football team, the worst record against the spread in all of the NFL, just 1-7. Something's got to give. I think it's the Bucks covering by nine and a half. I think Washington might be able to keep this one close. I have no idea, though. I'm staying away from it entirely. (laughs) Obviously, Chris Godwin has mispracticed this week. There's not going to be Gronk. There's probably not going to be Antonio Brown. I don't know, man. It just strikes me as something where Washington might be able to uh, keep this. Again, I'd love it at 10, but it's not going to get there. How about, we already talked about that one. How about the Chargers laying three at home to the Vikings? I have no trust in the Minnesota Vikings. I like the Los Angeles Chargers. They have played in two straight three-point games. I loved it at two and a half. Now it's up to three, but I'd still take the Chargers in the points. I'm just running away from it entirely. I don't want to go anywhere near it. How about the Cardinals laying 10 and a half to the Panthers? I assume, by the way, it's still going to be P.J. Walker, right? There's no way Cam is ready to go yet in this one. Okay. Cardinals laying 10 and a half. 
If it was, that would be crazy because he has not played <laughs> under Matt Rule, so that would be absolutely nuts if he was ready with the offensive scheme. I kind of want to see P.J. Walker. I think it's the XFL brain of me that sure. thinks there's some hope left in the way that quarterbacking can be played in the NFL. But no, if I was looking at this, the Cardinals have the best cover margin in the NFL at over 10 points. Maybe they can cover 10 and a half. How about the Broncos at home laying two and a half to the Eagles? This was at three earlier in the week when we looked at it. So it's moved a little bit here. Oh, two and a half. God. Just disgusting football. Terrible. I don't really want any part of the Eagles and Broncos. I thought about putting this in our rundown for our show tomorrow on our football Friday. And I was like, nobody cares about this. Game. I'm <laughs> staying away from it. That is fair. Uh, we talked about it. You don't want any part, right, of the Chiefs visiting the Raiders and laying two and a half points on either side of it. I mean... <sighs> The idea, as my father taught me from a young age, hometown dog in a primetime game, I'm not sure the metrics back that up so much. I'm still a believer, and maybe that is the fan in me, of the Kansas City Chiefs that only two and a half against this Raiders team, like something, somehow, some way. But no, I can't really touch that number. That's the thing. I'm like, I, I want it to be the Chiefs, and, and I feel like it should be the Chiefs, and I've got absolutely no way to justify it being the Chiefs. So I'm staying away. Last one, Monday Night Football, the Rams are visiting the 49ers. 49ers are getting four points here. Completely agree with the market movement in the Rams' favor early on for this Monday night game. I am not pleased with what I'm seeing out of the San Francisco 49ers, who now have the longest odds to win the NFC West after being the preseason favorites. I think the Rams, who just got owned by the Titans in their own home stadium, now go on the road up north to Northern California in Santa Clara. I think the Rams can cover that. And it was great having you on. I'm glad we were finally able to do it. I guess thank you to Joe for uh, making sure that this could happen. Remind everybody where they can check you out and your work. Uh, at Ben Scott Stevens on Twitter. And then as Dan mentioned at the start of the show, I host the morning after on Sports Grid every weekday morning, 9 a.m. to noon Eastern, where we do what we did here, try to educate you on how to become a better sports better, having a little bit of fun along the way in an engaging and informative format. So that's at Sports Grid, Sirius XM, Channel 159 on Sports Grid Radio, all across the place. There's people, Dan, that reach out to me from places like, hey, I'm watching you in Glenwood, Iowa. I'm like, I didn't even know we were affiliated out there, but sounds great. So it's places I don't even know, but we do have a YouTube TV channel now. So maybe that's the easiest format. Awesome. He's Ben Stevens. I'm Dan Harris. You can find us again on Monday with our early reaction to the week 11 lines. Enjoy your weekend of football, everybody. I'll talk to you.